it's uh, such a, a huge topic, and its importance is beyond the words. We have 925 million people who don't have food to eat out of 7 billion. Just to give you a comparison, about 841 million people live in the entire United States, Canada, and Europe. Every seventh person will go to sleep without food. And I apologize for giving the stats while you guys are just starting your dinner. <laughs> 65% of these 925 million people are women. About one-fourth of the children are undernourished, underweight. And most of these people live in only seven countries. China, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Ethiopia. And today we are here to uncover that what are the causes for this solvable <coughs> problem, obviously. And um, obviously, we are greatly honored to have such experts here, and we're going to try to explore the topic. Dr. Bement, I would like to request you to talk a little bit about the Global Research Institute and mm -hmm. how it became to being before we. Um, the Global Policy Research Institute is two and a half years old, so we're fairly young. It was uh, conceived by the faculty four years ago as they were developing the strategic plan for Purdue University. And one of the goals of the plan was to meet global challenges. And the feeling of the faculty was that uh, there was a need for a policy institute to do just that. So if you just take the GPRI, G deals with global issues. P, it has to do with policy issues and science informing policy. Research is done by research through the faculty, so it's a fully embedded institute within the university. And <clears throat> the I is institutionalized in the sense that we're not a self-standing institute, but we're affiliated with 46 centers, interdisciplinary centers throughout the university. And you may think that's quite a few, but that's 46 out of 200 research uh, centers at Purdue. Um, our goal is not just to be a gun for hire and deal with short-term problems <clears throat> or to answer questions from legislators or members of Congress who are focused pretty much on what they can do and leaving a legacy before their next election. But we're developing data that we feel will have an impact on policy making for the rest of the century because the problems we're working with are called wicked problems. They're sort of systems of systems type problems. And we're primarily focused on seven interconnected themes. <laughs> and that distinguishes us from uh, many other policy centers at universities who are probably not global. If you, if you just take the global part of it alone, you get down to about 10% of the centers at universities in the US. <laughs> If you deal with more than two themes, you can eliminate almost 80% of the remainder. And if you consider that we're not self-standing, but we're integrated within the university, you get down to one, <laughs> and that's GPRI. And I think I'll stop there and maybe come back later. <laughs> Dr. Zera, you have characterized hunger being the humanity's foremost challenge. And in the midst of such grand challenges, how did you come to this conclusion? Would you please? Yeah, we have <clears throat> so many challenges uh, hitting us, but uh, nothing defines humanity than food um, that sustains us. And in my way of looking at it, uh, we're, we're entering a new era in global food security. Uh, I think as you indicated and gave the statistics, a very steadily growing world population that we have and therefore the need to increase food production to support it. 
But at the same time, very often when we talk about hunger we, and food insecurity, we, we tend to think about poor developing countries, which is, which is true because most of the needs are over there. But I really think we need to, be able, we need to begin to think about globally. And uh, part of that is at the same time that we're trying to increase food for a very rapidly growing world population, we are also concerned about the fragility of our varied ecosystems and, and therefore the need that we would need to develop um, a means to um, be better stewards for our natural resource systems. And I think one of the things that I am very um, confident this group knows about as much or more than anybody is about how science and technology have changed the way we live in this world today. And in that, that the way we live has, has changed in that in my field, for example, how we produce and use our food systems uh, or how we take care of our health, um, how we travel and communicate with each other. And in so doing, through these technologies, we have literally shrunk the world into a small a global village. And in sharing what we know, the science and technology, uh, we have increased the demand for food around the world and changed uh, the diets and food systems of the world, adding again a much greater demand on the global land use. So we're really squeezing the single planet that we have and the other dimension um, of, of this is that we're beginning to realize, and perhaps in the last five, 10 years, that the hunger that you define, the problems that we have around the world that take place in the far fringes of the world are beginning to have pressure on the rest of the world, including the developed world, in bringing about more demand for food, feed, and, and fuel demands. And therefore, um, again, the, these problems that arise so far away from us are beginning to have ramification in defining and giving us an eerie sense of emergency and food insecurity, even in the rest of the developed world. And so you add all of these problems that we have seen happening and these are real, and then you add on to that these so-called eminent challenges, so the grand challenges that you raise, whether it is climate change uh, or this tremendous pressure of water, the diminishing water resources, but fresh water resources around the world, and then the declining energy uh, resources. And so the pressures that are coming from this are really putting this planet under tremendous uh, pressure such that these distant problems that we see today may not be that distance even for the developed world. And therefore, um, I worry about um, the global situation in food and our ability to continually sustain uh, this high level of uh, food systems that we have for ourselves, uh, whether or not that is, that is sustainable. And then just the statistics that I want to throw away uh, in passing is even in this magnificent country with tremendous resources and a lot of know-how and technology and so on. And we're talking about some 49 million in food insecure people in this country. And so global food security, in my way of looking at it, is probably the single foremost challenge humanity would face in this 21st century. So in 2030, we are about 50% of the land will be malnourished for water by, oh, from over tilling. And um, what do you think we are doing to restore it? So if, if you, not only that you have a population growing to almost 9 billion by 2050, but you also have the, the land which is available to even produce food today being unavailable. Available and declining the area. So what do you think is the solution? How would you, how would you solve that? The, the problem is real. 
Um, you know, these two resources that you just mentioned are incredibly um, pressing. The, of all the resources that we have to be concerned about, probably the single most resource that we are under huge pressure for is water, fresh water use. 70% uh, of the fresh water use around the world is used for agriculture. Only household and industry uses only 30% of the fresh. And, and again, much of agriculture utilizes water and the significant advance that we had made in agriculture is because of our ability to utilize fresh water and nutrients and fertilizer and pesticides to be able to produce. And so in this country, for example, on the western part of this country, the Agulala Aquifer, the, the aquifer is getting lower and lower, feeling the pressure for water all the way from Washington to New Mexico. And around the world, more and more of farmers are wanting to use more and more of water that they have available to be able to produce more food. And the same people that we are wanting to produce more food are going to be competing for water from another source that was not in competition before, and that is urban people. Because only around 2000 was really when this world became for the first time more urban than rural. And so uh, as urban population growth, in general, the statistics are there are more resources in urban communities than in rural communities. And so these rural communities that are supposed to be producing more food are going to be needing more water, and yet they can compete with the urban community. And therefore, we are going to be, as the cliche goes, needing to produce you know, more crop for a drop of water. And, and that is a huge pressure. Land is the other statistics. There is supposed to be some, maybe only 12 to 15% more arable land that can be brought under cultivation without deforestation. And so these, these two huge material resources that we need to produce food, land and water, are under incredibly high pressure. So as I tell you this, uh, scary statistics and the realities that we in agriculture face, but I also realize that we don't have any other solution other than relying again on the things that we relied on in the past, and that is science, technology, and innovation is a way to go. And so to answer your question in a roundabout way, I really think you know, we need to begin to invest in science and technology and innovation and enterprise development to advance this today before it's too late. And, and, and I think the reason, the places where we, we have not done as well is we've taken the success of particularly American agriculture for granted. And we have entered the period of the last two, three decades of complacency, and so we've slackened in our investments, particularly public investments in science and technology to address tomorrow's problem before they get worse. Thank you. Dr. Bemet, you were the head of National Science Foundation. You were a chief technology officer. I mean, wearing your technology hat as a technologist, which technologies do you believe can come and help and rescue? Because problem is not going away, and demand is not going away. The degradation of resources are not going away. So well, is there any yeah, so chance? As, as Gabisa pointed out, technology is part of the solution. First of all, in some parts of the world, 40% of the uh, food that's uh, grown is wasted. Uh, it's wasted because it's not preserved, it's not properly stored, 